Hello, my name is M.K. Davis. You know, in the years that I have been, uh, you know, analyzing films and and looking at photos uh, of, of Bigfoot and other things, um, you know, I, I, I've come to realize that this is, a, at times, a very harsh business to be in. And that a lot of times the criticism that's leveled at you, uh, you know, seems to come out of nowhere and be just uh, driven by venom. Uh, and and I I usually don't respond, you know. Uh, I just continue to you know try to do good work. And sometimes you know you 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 ask yourself, is that really the right thing to do? Or maybe perhaps maybe I should address some of these things because these people you know just seem to find no no end uh, as to what they will say about you. Uh, and so I decided maybe maybe I'll put something together and and, and I'll start by perhaps you know uh, just taking those a few of those allegations you know right off the blogs and and just see what I if I can answer them with images uh, and I've always been a person of images and uh, image is worth a thousand words and sometimes many many more words so uh, let's just look at some of the some of the allegations and then I'll just try to answer them with images themselves. Uh, let's first, let's take a look at the allegations. Here's a comment that was leveled at me by a less than saintly St. Michael. M.K. Davis's massacre theory has no place in serious Bigfoot research or conversations. Like I said before, M.K. added more phony colorizations of the PG video than Ted Turner did movies. Muzzle flash, bloody dog prints, pools of red blood with Sasquatch skins. Okay. Well, that, that's okay if he doesn't believe that. I, I don't require anybody to believe anything. You know, that's that's the reason I put this stuff out there is that folks can get a, you know, at least look at it get, and they can at least educate themselves as to whether they want to believe it or not. Uh, but let me just show you, you know, one item by item why I came to some of the conclusions I did. So, uh, just let's just take a look. Let's address the first one. Understand that I'm not trying to make judgments on anybody, but I do want to report what's on the film. And, and if it's not on every copy of the film, that's okay, because you can't pick and choose which copy is correct or which is not. Uh, the fact that it do, isn't on one copy, it may, that may actually be the anomaly because you don't know the history of the film, who's handled it, uh, its chain of custody. So uh, the, the lack of this, uh, on this particular uh, thing being on another copy is not, does not mean much. Um, it should be noted that it's on one copy and not another copy. But my point was that if it were only on one frame, I would not have any problem at all with dismissing it. The fact that it's on two frames, and these frames uh, are, are, are have had the camera panned by the camera operator, and yet they still appear at the same spot on the frame, that's much more meaningful. Now, that's a good indication that you're looking at something that really happened. So, you know, if it is or if it isn't, it, it, it's not known positively, so you, you accept it as, as being on the film. Uh, unless you can eliminate it, and it has not been eliminated. So let, let's just go right to that particular thing. Now this is in slow motion, and watch over on the right-hand side of the frame, and you'll see that this burst of light occurs over more than one frame, with the camera being panned. So this is a, a stabilized version of it, but you can see that because it's on two frames, you must take it seriously. You absolutely must. The, the likelihood of the same anomaly occurring on two different frames at the same spot in the film on the hillside there, while the camera is being operated by hand, is astronomically low. You know, so you, you can't just dismiss it. It is data. Uh, a lens flare occurs when you have a br brilliant source of light entering a, a compound lens, and that brilliant so source of light will creep between the elements of that compound lens and produce a lens flare and uh, you know that what you see there is an example of a lens flare now uh, i can call it a lot of things it could be a camera flash somebody could be over you know snapping away with a camera or but they had guns it could be a muzzle flash uh it could be somebody with a mirror you know it could be somebody with something chrome but it's something you know 
don't if someone says that this is an anomaly on the film they don't know what they're talking about uh anyway let's move on now let's address the the issue of the bloody dog print uh, when I visited with Mrs. Patterson back in March of 2008, uh, Mrs. Patterson uh, had a shoe box, and in that shoe box uh, were a number of things, and, and she went to pull out an envelope, and, and of course the envelope hung up on some of the other stuff and pitched them out into the floor, and the, amongst the stuff that fell to the floor were four by five inch transparencies taken from the film, and according to her, from the original film. And uh, if you look at the quality of this, you you have to agree, you know, that it, it, it certainly must be from the original. It is excellent quality. Uh, uh, one of the other things that were a little bit uh, different about them were they had a, more information around the periphery. They were a wider field of view. So uh, I was really taken back by their quality, and she allowed me to go and have them professionally scanned and... Uh, there in Yakima uh, at Photo House, and I did that, and, and I want to just share 352 with you. Uh, so let's look at it and follow as it as I crop it and it and, and boost the contrast. That's all that's being done is boosting the contrast, and you'll see, you know, what where I'm coming from when it comes to dog prints. Okay, this is frame 352 that I got from Mrs. Patterson, and, it, and you might have seen it before because I'm the one who made it available to researchers. Uh, and take a look at the very bottom edge, and you'll see I start to zoom in a little bit, and a little bit more, and you start to see a little spot there in the center of the frame at the bottom. I take a look when I boosted the contrast, and then I enlarge it, and there you go. There you go. <laughs> It most certainly is red, and it most certainly is a dog print. And, you know, I, I, it's not for me to judge, uh, you know, but I have a reason to believe the things I believe. Now, let me just go on from that point. You know, this this is what kind of went on my mind when I saw that the dog print at the bottom of frame 352. Is that my mind went back to another image that I got from Mrs. Patterson, and I'm going to show it to you. Now, this image uh, uh, was one of those who fell out on the floor. I held it up to the light, and I, I was just sort of aghast at it. Uh, and I took it outside where the sun could shine on it, and I put a piece of typing paper behind it so that it would become a platen image uh, rather than just a transmission image so that I would get a good look at it. And, and, and here you see a photo that I took with my, my uh, camera uh, in, in her yard, uh, with the sunlight shining through it and, and a piece of white type and paper behind it. And you can see that my thumb is quite naturally colored. So, you know, I, it's, it ought to be clear to anybody that, you know, I haven't added any of this color because they're all taken in the same frame. Uh, so let's just take a look at this. Now here's that image and you, there's a little piece of white type and paper behind it and you see my thumb there. And my thumb is quite naturally uh, colored. You see what's in there. This berm is on the right, circling around toward the left. This is not the creek. This is not Bluff Creek. This is an excavated pit. The creek actually is flowing from right to left. And uh, in the curvature of that berm right there, uh, in order to produce that, the creek would have to be flowing from left to right, and that's simply not the case. Uh, that is actually an excavated pit, uh, and it's full of something red. Uh, you know, and I didn't put it there. I didn't color it, and, and and I was so so interested in 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 the integrity of that photo that you know I traveled all the way. Well, first first of all, you got a bloody dog print in the bottom of three five two, and then you got a bloody red hole in another frame from the film. Well, what possibly could have created these anomalies? Well, what brought the two together? Where did the, the did it come out of the hole and get on a dog and then get on the sand? Where's the dog? Well, let's take a look. This is from another film of about that same time period, and they're they're down in Bluff Creek and they have a gun and they have a dog and and they're 
showing that dog uh, just just if you look at the, you can see the dog's reflection in a little pool there and if you look close you can see that it's tinted red as well uh now they say they're not connected but that little that dog print down at the bottom of 352 says differently and it explains an awful lot uh, you know if people that know sasquatch know they don't parade out in front of you in broad daylight and that's why this film has never been duplicated uh, because the conditions that it was taken under were unique and you had a dog that would actually chase a sasquatch or you could hunt with it that, that if you get on the trail of a genuine sasquatch with that dog you know, you're gonna find it you know, and if, whatever you, you want to do to it you can do to it they're not built for speed so you have this very high quality frame 352 and with the bloody dog print on it and then you have the source of the material that the dog print probably uh, uh, was made from probable source and, and and so you know what is any what is this saying uh, people are saying that I put that red there um, so I took an actual copy of the film to an expert, an absolute expert on op an optical physicist, retired physicist from the Navy. And I, I didn't know this man, but I was, uh, was introduced to him by a third party, and he has impeccable credentials. He has used many times to testify on, on optical things and f things regarding film. And I let him look at the film. I let him look at what was on it. And he was willing and ready and more than willing to go on record that I did not introduce Red to this copy of the film or this frame or any of it. Uh, and his name is Bruce McAbee. Uh, so let's just listen to Dr. McAbee uh, when he talks about it. Okay, now it's rolling. Now, reg uh, regarding the, uh, the material, red material in the hole. Yes, I saw uh, M.K. Davis... Uh, put his uh, film through this film analog, this film copier here, digitizer, and um, put the data onto the uh, SD card, a new SD card, stick that into his computer, and uh, bring up a picture from the uh, from the film that he started from, and it's clear that the uh, hole in the, uh, the ground, the sand, or it's not really sand, uh, was red. It looked like some reddish fluid had perhaps dried in there. At any rate, it was definitely red. Okay, I thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Appreciate your visit. Now, you know, uh, yeah, you'd think uh, something like this. You know, I drove all the way to Ohio to talk to this man and let him look at the film and and let him, you know, uh, watch and make sure that there's no introduction of color to it and testify that it was red and this is an optical physicist a person with credentials and you hope you hope that it will quell those types of accusations but you wonder in your mind where those accusations really came from you know because those people didn't know that i had introduced anything to the film anyway uh, they, they just cook it off off the top of their heads but there's a lot of mean-spirited people out there, and so I, I, I submit this to you, uh, my, the viewers on YouTube, uh, so that you can know and understand, you know, that the, the, the many years that I have put into looking at the Patterson film, I, I, the stuff that I've come up with is, is, is based upon, you know, solid material. Um, so, you know, whatever happened down there, you know, clearly something did, you know, and, and, and the, the film sp still speaks for itself. You know, it, it's a genuine article. Uh, what doesn't uh, jibe is the story behind the taking of the film. You know, Sas people who know Sasquatch will tell you they don't walk out in front of you like that. There has to be some really compelling reason. And take a look at that dog print down at the bottom. Take a look at that hunter those hunters and, and that dog handler take a look at that bloody red hole and, and and listen to dr maccabee talk about it, it not having been introduced to the film and make up your own mind I, I hope these images can kind of give you enough information to to think with 
and that you're not bound by the story of the taking of the film because, you know, it, it doesn't matter how a person comes across. You know, they, they may just sound so sincere. But, you know, you can't film. Film doesn't lie. And, and if you take a film as good as this film is and you try to edit it to match your story, you're still going to miss things. And you're going to. And that's what has occurred. Uh, you know, so make up your own mind. Uh, think for yourself. I, I encourage everyone to do that. You're not required to agree with me. But I assure you, these images are, are, are uh, I can vouch for their veracity. Uh, they are the good stuff. And I thank you for your time.